swing the game back in his favor. So we'll just have to see what unearthly draws Mundungu does here. Mundungu doesn't cast Pure. You're watching the Eternal Tournament Series. Hello and welcome back to the Eternal Tournament Series Season 6, Week 5, Tale of Horse Traver Edition. Uh, I am Serino, and hey, somebody's joining me now. Hello and welcome to Loco Pojo. How you doing, buddy? Hey, I'm doing good today. Yeah, we're having a pretty good time and looking forward to seeing this matchup. Uh, Going to be pretty exciting. Yep, the first round was filled with excitement, and that's going to continue as we see another Argentport versus Fire Deck kind of matchup here. We've got Serb on Argentport Bulls, as he's calling it. Uh, looks kind of just sort of like the old Bartolo with weapons kind of deck, but now you've got Tavrod, Copper Hall, Bailiff, Orc, Interrogator all in there, um, and Tranquil Scholar at the two spots. So that's there, there's just mid-range goodness with, with Tavrod kind of being the, the mid-game engine to keep the grind going. On the other end, we've got one of the more popular decks today, which is Skycrag Aggro. There's all sorts of flavors of it, and we see Suga on his own take here. Uh, this one featuring, I don't think, any new cards in the main deck. No Crimson Fire Mauls or uh, Cinder Yetis here. Just good old fashioned set one and two cards with some some Alpine trackers to kill your own one drops. What do you think of that, Boko Pojo? Trackers are pretty interesting and unique. There's some drawbacks to running them here, specifically the fact that he's running the Pyro Knights and Oni Ronins, as well as of course Snow Crust Yeti and some cards with Aegises. But yeah. they do work very well against the counter aggro matchup. You have the ability to play them defensively, and combined with the Furnace Mages to knock out weapons, he's definitely playing a sort of um, a very careful style of Skycracker that's much more prepared for what you would expect to be like a prevailing match of some kind yeah the main deck furnace mage seems like a nod i would i would guess to the the chalice matchup or something like that uh but yeah as you said ready for the the aggro mirrors with not only the three alpine trackers main deck but four rock slides so uh if they're running into any other decks also playing oni ronins and pyronites they're going to be able to take those out and get control of the board early and if they don't alpine tracker will help them regain board control but here that doesn't matter as he's up against Argentport, bartolo and bulls and uh who do you who do you like in this matchup do you think the the skycrag aggro deck will be fast enough to take out these bulls on parade chance it really depends on whether or not the blood letters and the lothry falchions are landing on the right targets Suga has an interesting advantage here in that while the alpine trackers are not traditionally good against the sort of aggro to mid-range that's going on here in Argentport, he does have the ability to just interact very profitably with bartholo using alpine trackers he can pop that aegis off and then he can just start knocking those units down so if he can kill enough stuff uh, it works out pretty well, but Tavrod's a really, really rough thing to get over in Skycrag, and there's not really a lot in the Skycrag aggro deck that does it. I think that probably the Archimport deck is overall favored. Yeah, I think Skycrag's goal here will be to win the game or get there with Reach before Tavrod shows up, and that's certainly doable when you have a suite that involves four Torch and four, four Permafrost. You can get control of the board early. It's just, can you leverage that into the mid to late game and finish before this, as you mentioned, all this life gain from the Archibald deck turns it around. So we're going to give the players the go-ahead here as a are uh, resolving and get this match underway. Yeah, it should be good. I think uh, one thing that Serb might have going for him, if he can make it through the first round is he has four polymorphs in the sideboard and that's the card that he actually needs to kill tavrod and set it up for like, oh, some yeah. pretty good two for ones or well some pretty good like even trades with alpine tracker yeah uh, he's already got the rock slides and the trackers in there so he's got some ability to deal with the mid-rangey stuff later on well i would say this game script is already going terribly for sugar not only did he not have a one or a two drop but serb did have a two drop and even if even if Sir or Suga somehow did get on the board. The double Copper Hall Bailiffs are going to do so much work. But we see instead, Serb does draw a shiny Bartolo. That could be the weapon of choice here with that Lethrai Falchion already in hand. These other three drops in hand just straight died at Torch. So 
it's an interesting uh, choice here of that Serb. On the other end, Sugar yeah. just has ping effects. Like with the Copper Hall Bailiffs, there's not really a lot of opportunity to play them down. So Sugar sort of like uh, move into the mid range, unfortunately, yeah. might help him a little bit here. He can play Alpine Tracker to pop the Bartholo. He can then hit it with a rock slide. Like if the weapon gets on Bartholo, that's a problem. But um, he does have some tools to sort of deal with mm -hmm. Serp's problems while also attacking in. I think that it's uh, it's really it's still really rough. You're trading against a deck that really just wants to do life steal, and that's a very good anti aggro matchup. So yeah, yeah. So Serb opts to not put the Falchion on the Bart now that Bart lost his Aegis. Putting a Falchion on that just exposes it to Torch or Permafrost. Instead, going to hold on for a better opportunity. While you're still at 21 life, you don't need guaranteed life point swing and put it all in on Bart. See the rock and take down Bartolo there. Uh, instead deploying the Interrogator, which, if it receives a Falchion, will not only be start drawing cards, and it'll negate the drawback of that one damage a turn. So we'll see if uh, Serb goes in that direction, or just play out more units. Against Swing, it definitely is very meaningful if he hits it, and there's not really any way he's not going to hit it. Sugar can... Uh, kill it with an Alpine Tracker plus a Rock Slide, but the Rock Slide's gone now, so now he needs torches. He needs some better answer to draw into to get rid of the Falchion. And once that happens, he can resume aggro, but he's still going to lose eight health worth of swing, so it's a pretty rough trade. Yeah, and Serb can even go with a, the odd line of not even attacking here, but here we see the attack come in. Make sure he to both block and use a spell. He's happy with that trade, and if the trade doesn't happen, now it's alive, you gained a ton of life, and we drew a card. As we see, the power of Orc Interrogator. 8-4 lifesteal at the end of your turn? Well, he's got enough strength, so you're drawing a card, normally losing a life, but again, that lifesteal on an Orc Interrogator. Yeah, it's a pretty tricky situation. Uh, from here, Suga has Champion of Fury, weirdly, as a defensive unit. Right. An Alpine Tracker and Fury and try to push in, neither of yeah. which looks particularly amazing. Yeah, Sugar goes with keeping the Fury Champion of Fury back. You simply can't run an 8-4 lifesteal when your opponent's also drawing extra cards and playing more for that. Here we see the Tranquil Scholar come down, give double damage to, I assume, one of the Bailiffs, because they're going to play a Bailiff here to shrink the Champion of Fury, swing in with Orc Interrogator. At least that I would play out this turn. We'll see if that's what Serb just build up. Yep, there's the Bailiff with double damage. Shrinks down that Champion of Fury along with Alpine Tracker Buddies, and another swing in for eight. Sugar's down to five, Serbs up to 29, and drawing cards, and has all these double damage units. Yeah, those double damage units mean that he can trade with anything that Sugar's got, and Sugar's only advantage here was that his units were weirdly bigger. So I think he's definitely going to go down in the first round, but uh, we might see a comeback of some kind, depending on the sides, but... Yeah, this is looking pretty done. Yeah, the power of Copper Hall Bailiff and Oric Interrogator here. The rare three drop Minotaurs from the two latest campaigns. I've been kind of joking that Copper Hall Bailiff's almost, uh, you know, it was a Jack's Bounty card, but it almost feels like it's a Tale of Horse Traver card just with how much we've been seeing it lately since Tavrod and Oric Interrogator showed up. It's kind of been going through a, a comeback or a renaissance. Yeah, good Minotaur decks are definitely in high supply at this point. Tafrod makes them all quite a lot better, and uh, there's enough good cards now that it's almost starting to look like just a good archetype all on its own. Um, with the Blood Letter there, that's enough damage to really put Sugar on the back foot, and the second Copper Hall means that there's just no good blocks. So uh, we see a lot of sort of chump trades, and it's just not uh, going so well for Sugar right now. Yeah, Serb was about to gain 18 life there as well to pad that life total, and Skycrag's just not from anything like that. So Serb, with we're just seeing Minotaurs win all day so far on, on camera, no matter what kind of flavor you play it. And we go to sideboarding here as Serb is up one. So what do you think Sugar needs to do with their sideboard here to have a shot at making the, the reverse sweep? Well, Sugar can either try to 
push well sugar's sideboard actually only pushes towards the mid range if he wants it so he can run in the crimson fire Maws and the soul fire drakes and try to go a little bit later game do that extra damage the problem with that is that it doesn't give him a good way to interact with the lethry falchions which are probably the key card in the deck in terms of just ch exchanging damage over and over again uh he definitely needs i think all four of those polymars being able to hit tavrod being able to hit anything that's been uh really expanded in size is pretty important here uh, i'd probably Probably honestly just cut some of the one drops that are kind of mm -hmm. not interacting very well with Hellfine Tracker and go up because going down doesn't really look like anything you can do with the sideboard right now. Yeah, I think if you try and stick to these this one drop strategy, you're just gonna run into trouble with all of Copper Hall bailiffs that we saw from that last game. So uh one of the weaknesses if you, of these Argentport decks is they don't naturally play a lot of flyers, so they're exposed to flying damage. So I think this Fire Mall Soul Fire Drake plan could get there but as you mentioned it can just be real hard to race these units with life seal even if you polymorph them they can still they still can have their weapons attached but i think polymorph still has some appeal just because polymorph pairs so well with rock slide and alpine tractor it's going to kill and deal with a lot of stuff but but i do think we're going to see as we're looking at sugar sideboard right now maybe go a little bit bigger no we we see all the one drops stay in there if i correctly all the Oni Ronins, all the Pyronite Snow, Snow Crush Yetis still in the deck. So I guess he's just going to hope that uh, basically Serb doesn't draw the Bailiffs, right? Instead going to try and go wide and... Should be pretty good for him if he can run it. It's just really, really hard to deal with that... Just one big card, Tavrod Auric Broker. There's no way that he can interact with it in more than one card, with the exception of Polymorph. That still leaves a unit behind that can be felchoned or set up in some yeah. way with Bloodletter. So it's just, it's not looking great for Suga in this matchup. And I think that's a, a significant problem. You definitely need to be prepared for Tavrod in the first Horus Trappers tournament. So mm -hmm. we'll see if he can get it going, but it's going to be yeah. a little bit tricky. Yeah, and I think it's a philosophical approach. Well, like, some people think the best way to answer kill the Tavrod, and other people might disagree and say the best way to beat Tavrod is to kill the player that played Tavrod, right? He's not in play anymore if your opponent's dead. So I think that's the approach Suga's going to take here as well. If my opponent's going to slam down a Tavrod, I'm hoping to hit a base and hit We'll see if that philosophy pays off post-board. Yeah, he's, he's going to need some pretty direct face damage there to get there. So the yeah. obliterates are going to be as helpful as they can be here. He's got the rock slides to sort of clear up some of the smaller minotaurs, but uh, he doesn't have a lot of direct burn, and it's hard to permafrost past the Tavrod, so it's going to be a little bit tricky if uh, his opponent ever gets to five. However, his deck is capable of punishing people before they get to five, so uh, if he doesn't draw quite as badly as last time, he has a fighting chance. Yeah, and even if they do get the five, a full fire Drake out of nowhere can get the job done. It's Tavrod's big on the ground, but doesn't fly, thankfully. Uh, although sometimes I've, I've seen a few Tavrod decks playing that Elder's attack, and it's been pretty intimidating seeing that big bull take to the skies. Still waiting on, I guess, maybe Serb is taking their time, but this sideboard plan here. Uh, he's, he's got some decisions to make as well. I imagine the extra bailiff is coming in for sure. Do you think they go in a harsh rule direction? I don't think I'm that big of a fan against that kind of act. Yeah, it's it's interesting. I wouldn't say that harsh rule's super great here just because he's so capable of developing on board of his own that's pretty meaningful. Yeah. Uh, definitely, you just run into suffocates. The annihilates maybe would be pretty good as well. They don't hit the four twos and the five twos, so it's a little bit tricky, but being able to hit... Uh, most of the one drops is just really, really strong, I would say. Mm -hmm. And yeah, I guess he might be a little bit having a few issues just on the kind of the fact that if Suga decides to side out those one drops, the suffocates are actually not terribly useful. So even though they're the common counter aggro side, you might want to go up to the vanquishes or go up to the harsh rolls if you're expecting like more soulfire drakes and more uh, crimson fire moss. Right. Yeah, that's a really good point. As we see this match gets underway, is Serb may not have known, like, we saw how Suga sideboarded, but again, I speculated that hey, bring in the dragons, like you just said. So it's like, do, do you keep in the vanquishes and hope that they do bring in the, the dragons, or do you swap them for 
for the suffocates to deal with the cheap stuff. And we don't know how Sir Bill approached it, but we do know that this uh, he's got some two drops here as he plays out a Tranquil Scholar with Aegis. Hey, not a bad hit. So you can decide whether yeah. or not to give that to, looks like gives it to the Argentport Instigator. Artholo. So yeah, he has a pretty good setup here. He can basically just defend himself for a little while, set up the Argentport Instigator, put the Lothry Falchion on it to set up even better. But now we have a small issue, which is that he can play the Argentport Instigator, but he can't play the Lothry Falchion on it until he finds his double shadow. He can also opt for Bartholo, which works pretty well with the Blood Letter, but the Argentport Instigator blocks the 2-1, which is also pretty useful. So Great. it's a question of like whether or not he thinks the Argentport Instigator will live on the block. If it's not going to live on the block, then he might want to go for the Bartholo oh, aggressively. Yeah. He knows his opponent doesn't play Pummel or anything like that, so he doesn't have to worry about combat. Again, the Instigator has just Now, he also knows his opponent, uh, Sugar just missed on a power draw. So when your Skycrag opponent's stuck on power, that either means they've got a handful of like, cheap removal, because that's what Skycrag is, or big threats. But it looks like he just opts to use Slay, hope to take some threats off the board. And uh, yeah, Sugar has no follow-up, which I think will key you in on the idea that your opponent's hand is filled with removal and you want to play one of these Aegis units. By drawing that undepleted power, gets to play two two drops here. Yeah, he gets to set Ooh. up with just a lot of defense. Oh my god, and hits so... Endurance with this Tranquil <laughs> Scholar, shutting off these permafrosts in Sugar's hand. And now this either Bart or Instigator, whichever one gets Endurance, won't be able to be permafrosted. And that'll be huge once you get it out of torch range. As we see, he plays out the instigator with endurance and Aegis. And man, once that gets a falchion or a bloodletter, how does Sugar beat that? Pretty tricky. He can play the Alpine Tracker down and pop the Aegises, but that's the only thing that he has in the deck that's really going to work well against all of that Aegis setup. Uh, without the permafrosts on any of the small units, he can throw them on the Bartholo at least. Uh, so there's still some efficient ways that he can spend his power, and by attacking in with Bloodletter, and hopefully with Lothry Felchin next turn, he can still get those really, really good lifesteal exchanges, which are exactly what you want against Skycrack Aggro. Yep, so here we see the Bloodletter come down on the Instigator, it gives it lifesteal for this turn, which means these Death Trigger procs also gain Serb some life, and the reason he went with the Bloodletter round option is so that there was no double block option for the snow crush yet he's there and here we see torch pops the aegis on instigator turns it into a frog but that frog's still a four four it just doesn't have endurance anymore so now you can permafrost it later yeah um it's an interesting option three for one on an argent board instigator is definitely not that good especially when you're losing life in the process so Sugar is definitely a lot behind here, and Serb is going to keep playing threats while Sugar only has removal. So I think he's in a lot of trouble, and it's not looking good for him. Yeah, and, and I just can't emphasize enough how insane that Tranquil Scholar getting endurance there was, making Sugar have to play this whole awkward sequence of removal uh, here just to deal with essentially what was originally an awkward instigator, right? Giving it Aegis and endurance was just lined up so well against what Sugar's hand had. At this point, Suga has two one-drops to sort of attack in with and get some pressure going. If Serb finds his double shadow, that's going to be the Lothry Felchin, and that'll be enough to seal up the game, I think. But mm. yeah, And Suga can still recover, even though at the moment he's behind on board, he's behind on power, and he's behind on cards. Yep, so Serb finds another Tranquil Scholar, plays that out. It's quick draw, not a huge deal giving that to Bailiff, but eh, better than nothing, right? And we see the Annihilate on the Ronin, doesn't want to save it for a big dragon or something like that, instead just dealing with the War Cries instead and keeping the pressure up. Yep, we have and Lothry Felchin at the moment in the uh, Serb's hand. We have Suga with the Rock Slide and the Permafrost. Uh, at the moment, it's just not looking good. Like, we don't really have anything for Suga to play. He can set down his fourth power and get a little closer to Soulfire Drake later, but he's just mm -hmm. not in a good position. Yeah, right now, Serb is winning the race. Suga's only at 12. Serb is at 18 and has more attack on board. Um, Suga can use Rock Slide to, like, pop an Aegis or kill the tranquil scholar can't do both though rock slide either splits up the two damage or does it all on one 
Um, but Tech but Snowcrest Yeti, which is good offense, but certainly is just his last available unit. Yep, yep. But ooh, this trade off will give him some better information here. Uh, again, Serb hasn't hit double shadow as you know, no Falchion yet, but any. If Serb ever connects with this Falchion, the game will be over. But Suga just decides, use the Rock Slide, get the Permafrost on Bart now. And Serb finds the second Shadow Source via Vera's favor. Doesn't get to use it as removal, which you generally like to do in this matchup. But I think you still got to go with it here like that and get the Bailiff down. Yeah, at this point, Suga has to draw an answer for every threat. And then if he can kill the threat, he has a decent chance. But mm. we have the Lothryfelchin coming down right now, so that's another six health swing. Uh, and now he has to deal four damage to a unit on four power, which I don't think he has a card that can do that. He can get Permafrost. Yeah, and, and with that unit having quick draw, you can't even double block it here. And Tavrod, if this game wasn't already over, it was Talrod's going to absolutely shut the door on it as this Copper Hall Bailiff comes in again, gain six, and I wouldn't be shocked to just see a scoop in response to this Tavrod here. Yeah, that should be the round. Sugar could draw into a Polymorph and Chump, but that'll be the only thing that it would do it, and it's just not there. So uh, out he goes. Uh, the Skycrag deck definitely shuts down very, very hard in the face of Bloodletters and Lithrai Felchins, so it, it was just a really rough round for him, and he didn't have a lot of opportunities to come back from it. Uh, yeah. Certainly, if you can get rid of the units before they get those weapons on them, that's useful, but there's so many Aegises, and Serb got very useful with his Tranquil Scholars. Yeah, Tranquil, again, Tranquil Scholar getting in. Absolutely. I think that was that decided the game. It you know it was hard to tell at that point, but knowing especially from Serb's perspective, but knowing that Sugar had two permafrost in hand, that was just absolutely brutal. So uh, hats off to both players, and uh, looks like we're getting into a backup matchup. So or backup match. So we're getting that set up right now. We're going to jump in, and it looks like all right. We're gonna have. Everybody's favorite deck, Chalice, looks to be the matchup here. So we're going to jump in in just a sec. We've got Endkeeper up against Alphil. So let's get this set up. While we're doing that, was there, was there anything else that stood out from those, those last two decks that, that you liked on the at least the Argentport side? We've now seen Argentport take two two O's uh, on coverage already pretty well. A uh, very, very good early game setup into Tavrod in the mid game. Seems really, really nice. Uh, I think that that overall Bartolo th setup just seems like a pretty strong sort of interesting push that's going to change the meta up a little bit. We're we're going to see some movement away from that Skycrag row. We're going to see some movement away from like that particular type of meta. And uh, yeah, it's going to be really interesting to see where it goes. I'd expect to see a lot more mid-range, a lot less chalice, a lot less uh, straight aggro, and a lot more like sneaky aggro with some more interesting things going on, like the Argentport aggro decks. And uh, yeah, it could lead to some really interesting stuff. I don't know what's happening right here, but it's going to be pretty <laughs> exciting. Uh, uh, hopefully uh, somebody's found a solution yeah. to Tavrod by this point. Oh, yeah. Uh, I'm not, not too worried about the cow. But, yeah, here we are in game three. Looks like Endkeeper... Oh, we're in game two. Never mind. But uh, Alphil is on pure Huru control. Endkeeper is on Chalice. And we can see here, as Endkeeper draws a Chalice, it's got uh, a little fun effect on it. That's because Endkeeper has an Omen of Austerity placed on them, naming Crystal and Chalice. So Endkeeper, as long as he's got this Omen of Austerity on him, can't cast this Crystal and Chalice. And Huru has a Duelist Blade that was a 412 at some point, just beating down with these uh, Throne Wardens with Aegis as well. And they're... It's a, it's a so tough card used for what I would assume to be its intended purpose, which is just making chalice decks very, very uh, sad. I, uh, I would say uh, Omen of Austerity's purpose is actually to take out Obelisk because you can see it in the art. There's there's an Obelisk there. It's it's clearly its intent. <laughs> uh -huh. Well, I mean, you do go for the very, very iconic option. Uh, certainly yeah. there's the... Uh, the Cat Burglar gets Crown of Possibilities, but that's another card that I would say is pretty oriented towards making a lot of different decks sad. Um, so we've got the 4-4 and the Aegis here. Endkeeper has a Scorpion Wasp, so he can defend against these guys pretty well, but he's still got a Duelist Blade to contend with. So yeah, Alphil's deck is full of some interesting cards. 
Yeah, I'm actually trying to pull up Alphil's. I believe Alphil's weapons is, yeah, Champion of Order, three Champion of Order main deck. So the idea being you basically get a Champion of Order down in the late game, use Protect on it, and then if it survives that turn, you start getting more Champions of Order with Aegis, right? It's just units on units on units with Aegis. Here we see Endkeeper, though, draw a uh, Kothon, takes to the skies with him, which Alphil does not have well defended at the moment. Yeah, he's going to have to find a harsh rule or figure out some way to knock these guys out of the sky. Uh, I'm surprised by the choice of the Duelist Blade here. Perhaps he has an answer to the 4-4, an Island's Choice, or a Lightning Strike. If that's the case, then he can also take out the second Kothan, but he still has to deal with yet another Owl from that particular setup. Endkeeper is very slightly ahead on board, but because his card quality is generally weaker than Elphil's, uh, the inability to play Crystal and Chalice is going to come back, provided that Elphil can stay alive for a few more turns. Uh, the Duelist Blade... Yeah, he used the Duelist Blade on the Kothan, but he didn't have a way to defend himself against the Owl, so I'm not actually sure why he took the Kothan out first. Maybe to hope to bluff Island's Choice, as you mentioned, maybe get the owl to not swing or take less damage hitting the owl but here we go champion of orders here we saw endkeeper uh, hold on to their kothon um uh endkeeper would have had to harsh rule there but he just top decked into a desert marshal that's yeah. pretty disgusting if elfil has the protect then he can still force the just set of blocks but all right but tough. that swing by endkeeper saw no pause so now he knows there's no need to check for protect. Like, he already did by swinging with the Scorpion Moss first. That was a good play. And from here, he's got another 7 damage in the air every turn. Elfil's going to have to either harsh rule or just try and set up in a better way. Mm -hmm. A permafrost on the Scorpion Wasp, it's like he's bluffing the island's choice again, but... Might actually have, have it this time. <laughs> yeah, there yeah. we go. Was maybe actually might have had it before as well but didn't want to use it on an owl because they wanted to use it to protect from harsh rule once the champion of order came down and thought they could just That's, win yeah. even though even without the sky advantage but relenting here with the island's choice as we see and wow and keeper finds another wisdom what a big draw <laughs> into That's another best. kothon in parliament holy cow now, Wisdom's the best top deck that you can get at this point because it is just two top decks uh with the parliament and the kothon his board's suddenly just enormous. If Elfil's running Harsh Rules, then he can find a way out of this. But if he's not, then I think he's just dead here. Exactly six damage that he has coming in. So he'll live for one more turn to find that Harsh Rule. Yep, Elfil's not dead yet as Endkeeper draws a Sigil for a turn. Although, oh. no, one extra damage is going to get through on the ground as well. So that will be lethal. There's one it's off the Temple got... Scribe, so it's yeah, just Yeah, yeah. We, we were counting just the six in the air, but the one off scribe or frog will be lethal. We'll count it as frog lethal. That's kind. Even if Alphil won't block that way. Oh, I mean, you gotta get killed by the frog, right? No, it's a temple scribe. So uh, turn the book at him, and uh, we're gonna see seven damage right there. Yeah, unless Alphil's slow rolling an island's choice or something like that. Oh, now it's frog, frog lethal. lethal. There, there we go. There you go. So I. And, it's, and I'm getting word that that was path. game two. Yeah, Endkeeper gets it two to nothing. Chalice, even through the face of an omen of austerity, still gets the job done. Uh, turns out having Kothon in Great Parliament as your win cons means you don't need to be constantly drawing off Chalice if instead you're drawing with Wisdom the Elders into that those kind of late game threats. A look at Elfil's list. Uh, the Duelist Blades may not just be matching up as well against Kothan and yeah. Parliaments, so pretty and tricky Kothan. stuff. Yeah, I was I was not super impressed with the the Duelist Blades there on top of the four hammers, but it might have also just been a thing where he didn't have options. Let's see the there was vision of austerity, a rain of frogs to bring in, but it's not like lightning storms getting the job done all the time. Bank, which is always exactly what you want against. Could have just yeah. been next best things. In. There we go. Chalice takes that one. Congrats to Endkeeper, who not sure if they were in the one o bracket, bracket, but either way, they're uh, he'll be alive for top as we get ready for the next round. Uh, but before we do that, oh, his channels were fraud. Okay, Endkeeper had channel attempt as well that got. 
but still won anyways. But yeah, uh, so if you're wondering what's going on here, this is the Eternal Tournament series. So every week we have an open weekly that anybody can play in. Uh, seven weeks of that, that culminates in an invitational at the end of those seven qualifier weeks that has some awesome cash prizes. And then depending on how you do in those invitationals, there's a world championships that happens currently once a year, and that'll be coming up very soon. And that's got a $3,000 prize pool. Lots of cool prizes for the low, low cost of playing Eternal for free on your weekends. Uh, it's a pretty good deal, if you ask me. I know you've you've uh, taken up that deal before, haven't you, Loco? You, you've had fun in the ETS? Yeah, it's a really good time. It's a very good practice. If you want to get some high-level practice, then playing in the tournaments is one of the best ways to get better at the game. Uh, I really recommend it, Like even if you're new, if you just want to like uh, sign up and just get rocked for a couple of rounds or maybe even get lucky uh it's oh, definitely yeah. worth it it's a lot of fun you get to practice sideboarding which is a really important skill and like uh, it's it's way worth it for just like basically figuring out how the current meta is going finding new decks that are really interesting to play against i i love playing in the ets so it's a it's a delightful time yeah you don't get to play best of three a lot and i it's a format that i enjoy quite a bit and yeah as you said even if you've never played in it before, we've had plenty of first-time registrants take down an ETS. If, you, if you've, you've got a good run, if you know what you're doing in Eternal, or even if you don't, hey, it's again, the cost is $0 and just a Saturday afternoon or evening, depending. So it's a lot of fun. If you want more details on that, check it all out at rngeternal.com. And with that, we got to get ready for round three, and we'll be bringing you more action after just a short break. <laughs> 